Welcome to our second video, Philosophy 1150 Students. As I mentioned at the end of the last video, what we're going to be doing here is learning how to symbolize various sentences so that we can get at the form or underlying logical structure of those sentences. And since an argument is just a collection of sentences, we can symbolize the underlying logical structure of arguments, and this will help us in logically evaluating them to determine whether or not they are valid. What does it mean for an argument to be valid again? If the premises are all true, they might not be, but if they were, the conclusion would also have to be true. It would be impossible for the conclusion to be false. So that's the evaluation that we're going to be carrying out. And symbolizing is going to make that process easier for us. I'm going to start off this video as I did in the last video, and as I will be doing on a number of future occasions, by discussing some ideas that are maybe a little bit abstract for you, but I'm doing it in order to elaborate on the implications of the concrete stuff I'm going to speak about later. Might not be a bad idea after you've watched this entire video to watch some of the earlier stuff again and it should make a lot more sense to you the second time through. That being said, Here's a philosophical distinction. I draw your attention to the difference between language and reality. Language is a system of symbolic communication that human beings use to indicate all kinds of different things. To answer questions, to give commands, to display emotion, to display preferences. One other very important function, though, of language is to indicate propositional commitments. That is to say, to indicate claims about how the external world or reality really is. So, on the one hand, language consists of sentences Whereas reality is going to consist of, or be indicated by, propositions. We're using proposition again in a pretty technical sense, definitely not the everyday use. So, a sentence is really a string of symbols. It's a string of symbols that means something to a particular community of speakers. This very string of shapes on the board means something to English speakers. A proposition, on the other hand, is a commitment about reality, or a commitment about how the world is. So, we use language for many different purposes. In logic, though, the key purpose of language is to indicate propositions or commitments about reality. Now, in order to carry out a symbolization of the language that we use to indicate propositional commitments about how the world is, we're always going to have to comply with what's called the principle of uniform substitution. And the principle of uniform substitution says that a sentence can only be used to indicate one proposition or one commitment about reality. If we were to allow an individual sentence to indicate more than one commitment about how the world is, then we would be inviting confusion. Because any time you hear a sentence, you wouldn't be sure exactly what the speaker is committing themselves to, or exactly what the speaker is trying to get you to believe about the world. 
On the other hand, though, any particular commitment about how the world is can be indicated by any number of different unique sentences. So here's a few simple, concrete examples. Consider the first sentence. Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada today. The second sentence, Pierre Elliott Trudeau's third son will be the Prime Minister of Canada in 2020. Third claim, I was the Prime Minister of Canada four years ago. Notice, or sorry, the second sentence is stated in 2012. The third sentence, I was the Prime Minister of Canada four years ago, stated by Justin Trudeau in 2024. What we have here are three unique strings of symbols, three different sentences. But the all-important thing to notice here is that all three of these sentences, in the context in which they are uttered, indicate one and the same proposition or commitment about how the world is. Three unique sentences, all indicating, amongst other things, the same proposition or commitment about reality. Another way of looking at it is that all three sentences here are made true by the same state in the world, the state that is indicated by each of these three sentences in their respective contexts. So one last thing to say about the three sentences that used to be up here is that the fact that the individual we refer to as Justin Trudeau, who also happens to be the third son of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the man who was the Prime Minister of Canada in the 1970s, that fact about how the world is that's what makes each of those three different sentences true. So each of those three different sentences make one and the same claim about how the world is, and they're all made true by one and the same fact, namely that the person identified or called Justin Trudeau is indeed the Prime Minister of Canada in the year 2020. We move on now to consider just a couple of more things about languages. You may not have realized it, but there are in fact two different kinds of languages. The first kind we're all familiar with, these are called natural languages. Natural languages spontaneously arise in human communities. No individual controls how the symbolic system works or decides what the symbolic system is and is not used for. So, English is a natural language and like all natural languages, English has lots of different purposes. One of these purposes, the one we're going to be interested in in a logic class, is declaring propositions. That is to say, making commitments about how the world is. Now, linguistic communities often impose requirements on individual language users that are not logically relevant, such as stylistic expectations. A little bit later in this video, we'll see concrete examples of these, but it's very important to realize that 
with a natural language like English, there's going to be a range of different purposes for symbolic communication. And it's something that fascinates linguists how communities are able to spontaneously create these systems where there's no one really in charge. Natural languages can be contrasted with what are called artificial languages. Artificial languages are systems of representation and communication that are designed for very specific purposes by individuals or small groups of people. Mathematics, the notation of physics or chemistry, various kinds of programming languages are all examples of not natural languages, but artificial languages. Artificial languages are very narrow in scope as far as their purposes go. By design, an artificial language generally has one or very few purposes. So, we're going to learn an artificial language that's sometimes called SL, which stands for sentential logic or logical relations that hold between entire sentences. And this particular artificial language has one very specific purpose, to accurately represent simple and compound propositions. And very shortly, we'll be considering some examples of what these things are. But for now, I'll just repeat that propositions, both simple and compound, are commitments about how the world is. And we can use natural languages to indicate those commitments. We can also use artificial languages, most pointedly SL, to indicate those commitments. Here's the situation we're going to be facing. When we convert sentences and arguments that we come across in English from a natural language like English into the artificial language or notation SL, what we're going to be doing is two different things simultaneously. First of all, we're going to be editing out or ignoring all aspects of English meaning that are not logically relevant. The second thing we're going to be doing at the same time is making sure that every symbolization in SL exactly represents those aspects of meaning which are logically relevant. And just to repeat, the aspects of English meaning that are going to be logically relevant are the simple and compound propositions, commitments about how it is in the world, that are indicated by the English sentences being symbolized in SL. So this is what we're going to be doing. A natural language like English is one way of making commitments about how the world is, but it's not the most efficient way because natural languages like English often have more than one purpose being demonstrated at once. So we're going to use the artificial language SL in order to edit out all of the logically irrelevant noise, aspects of meaning in English sentences that aren't going to help us logically, and just focus in on those aspects of meaning that are logically relevant. I realize that you might not 
be fully comfortable with what I'm saying here because I've set out the abstract part first, but now we're going to move on to consider a number of concrete examples and generally speaking, what I'm going to say in the next part makes perfect sense to people after I've gone through a range of different concrete examples, as I had said earlier, you might want to come back to this earlier theoretical part. But, because it is important, but it's kind of hard to get it across if you haven't already acquainted yourself with the kinds of conceptual issues that it's designed to demonstrate. But at the same time, in order to describe the significance of the activities we're going to be doing concretely, you have to have a general sense of what we're up to. So it's a catch-22 situation, and we'll see other examples like this later. Having spent perhaps a little bit too long with the theoretical stuff underlying what we're about to do, we can now proceed to consider concrete examples of how to convert English sentences into sentences in the artificial language SL. The first thing to be aware of is the existence of what are called simple or atomic sentences. These are sentences with no underlying logical structure. We're going to use capital letters st to stand for each of the various simple sentences. Normally, you just pick the first letter of one of the prominent words in the sentence. So I've got a few examples here. Capital B is going to stand for the simple sentence, Brad is happy. Capital A is going to stand for the simple sentence, Angelina is happy. J will stand for the simple sentence, Jen is happy. Now, notice I've left the third sentence unnamed. Here's the situation. If we've already designated that capital A is going to stand for the simple sentence, Angelina is happy, we can't use A again to stand for the different simple sentence, Angelina is angry. And sometimes this happens where the two prominent words in the sentence both start with the letter A, and capital A already stands for something. We just have to pick another letter. So in this case, I will just stipulate that capital G is going to stand for the simple sentence, Angelina is angry. Then we have Jen is happy. Again, since J already stands for Jen is happy, if we want to have a letter to stand for the simple sentence, Jen is sad, we'll have capital S. Now we've got three other sentences. The first of the three new sentences, John Voigt's estranged daughter is mad. John Voigt's estranged daughter, of course, is Angelina, and being mad, being angry, are the same thing. So we could, theoretically, I guess, pick a new letter to stand for that sentence. But here's the important thing. We're not just concerned about the sentences, but we want to have all of the propositions or commitments about the world indicated by the same letter. So, since we've already chosen capital G to stand for the commitment about how the world is, namely that Angelina is angry, and since 
This sentence, John Voigt's estranged daughter is mad, it's making the same commitment about how the world is as this sentence. We want to symbolize both of those propositional commitments, one and the same propositional commitment, indicated by different English sentences with the letter G. In the same way, Brad's ex-wife is unhappy. We will symbolize that by capital S. And finally, Jen's first husband is glad. Jen's first husband being Brad, of course. So we're going to symbolize it with capital B. When we are converting English sentences into symbolic sentences in the language SL, we are, on the one hand, going to observe the uniform substitution principle. So, you can't have a capital letter stand for more than one commitment about how the world is. On the other hand, since this is an artificial language and we are specifying how it works for our own purposes, namely to perfectly indicate the form or underlying logical structure of English sentences, we're also going to stipulate that every identical propositional commitment is going to have the same letter. So that's the first aspect of our symbolic system. We're going to have any number of different simple commitments about how the world is. And these are going to be indicated by capital letters. So the capital letters in the language SL, the artificial language, are going to stand for simple sentences. Now, you might want to pause the video. I'm going to be referring to page two of the file, some notes and exercise questions. Some people find it handy to have a paper copy of all of these pages. You might just as well pause the video and open another window in the browser so that you can look at the second page of the some notes and exercise questions. What we have in the language SL then is a combination of simple or atomic sentences and compound sentences. Now I'm reading from the top of page two of some notes and exercise questions. Compound sentences are compounds of one or more atomic or simple sentences and one or more logical connectives. It's with the logical connectives that we're going to be able to specify form or underlying logical structure. There are two types of logical connective. First, there's the unary or one-place connective that attaches to a single sentence. And that single sentence could be simple, could be compound. And then there's the binary or two-place connective. That attaches or glues two different sentences together into one bigger sentence. And either of the sentences being glued together can be simple or compound. So the system of sentential logic symbolization we're going to learn, which is a standard one, has five connectives in total. One unary and four binary. We'll begin with the single unary connective. If you look down at the nifty table I've provided for you, it's the fifth one down, and the symbol itself looks like this. In many keyboards, it's the uppercase symbol. Uh, it occurs in different places. This particular symbol is called the tilde. 
In discrete math, they have a symbol that looks like that, which is called the hook. Don't ask me why, but there is no uniformity in the notation for the various symbols in standard sentential logic. So you can feel free to use either of these symbols. Returning to the table then, so this is called not the tilde but the tilde and the basic English equivalent for the logical relation indicated by the tilde is indicated by the English word not. So the compound sentence that we get by placing a tilde in front of another sentence is what's called a negation. So for example, if capital B stands for Brad is happy, if we put a tilde in front of it, so now we have a two-piece nugget, tilde B, this stands for Brad is not happy. It's not the case that Brad is happy. If we put a tilde in front of G, that stands for the sentence, Angelina is not angry, and so on. So that's the first of our five logical connectives, the tilde. It's a one-place connective, and it attaches to any sentence. Now we're going to consider two of the four two-place connectives. If we return to the chart at the bottom of page two in the file some notes and exercise questions you look at the top we see three different connective symbols one of them looks like this that symbol is called the ampersand often it's the uppercase character above the five on general typewriter typewriters or word processors. Then we have another symbol that looks like that. It's got the, so this is the ampersand. This symbol has the boring title of the dot. And finally we have this symbol, an upside down V, and that's called the carrot, which is often used in discrete math. So all three of these symbols indicate the logical relation that is basically indicated by the English word and. So we can, for, we can form the first compound binary sentence by connecting all we've got are simple sentences. Two simple sentences, let's say the first two, with the ampersand. So this string of three characters then stands for the double-barreled claim, Brad is happy and Angelina is happy. So this is a compound commitment about how the world is as compared to each of the individual commitments connected together by the ampersand. This entire sentence is called a conjunction, and if we had a need to refer to one of the parts of the conjunction, which we will later on, each of them are called conjuncts. This is the left conjunct, this is the right conjunct. Any two sentences can be pasted together to make a conjunction. So, Brad is happy and Angelina is happy. 
What if we had a sentence though, E ampersand S. Angelina is happy and Jen is sad. Here's our first example of a situation English speakers generally wouldn't say Angelina is happy and Jen is sad. Rather, they would say Angelina is happy but Jen is sad. What's the difference in meaning between the English words an and the English word but? Answer, the English word an is a conjunction indicator word. The English word but is both a conjunction indicator word as well as a contrast indicator word. As far as logical matters go though, the word and and the word but identify one and the same logical relation. In other words, in terms of what's logically relevant, the English words an and but mean the same thing. They indicate the conjunctive relation. If you look on page 3 of the sum notes and exercises, you'll see a whole range of words and phrases, examples that are listed to indicate the conjunctive relation. So, for example, someone might say, Angelina is happy even though Jen is sad. Here the two words string, even though, like the word but, is both indicating a conjunctive relation between the two sentences, as well as an element of contrast. In logic, all we're concerned about is the fact that a conjunctive relation is indicated, so we put the word AND there. Now let's consider the following sentence. Brad is happy and Angelina is happy and Jen is happy. So everyone's happy. What we have here is, so to speak, a triple conjunction. If you look back at the chart uh, near the bottom, this is the first situation where we're going to have to use brackets. There are two purposes of brackets. The primary one is to specify meaning or to remove ambiguity, that is to remove a situation where a sentence might mean one of, or one of two different things. In this case though, our first use of brackets is the secondary use to preserve binary structure. It'll be a little bit later in the course where we're going to see why every sentence has to be binary or able to be broken into two separate parts. But for now, we can just observe the restriction. So what that means is we need to put a set of brackets either around the first two conjuncts or around the last two conjuncts. In this somewhat specialized situation, it doesn't matter which location the brackets are at, but the brackets need to be there so that, and here I'll just focus on the top one, once we put the brackets in the top sentence, now we have a conjunction of a smaller conjunction on the left side and a simple sentence on the right side. So remember, we can use any of the connectives to attach together simple sentences or compound sentences. So here's an example where a compound sentence, the conjunction B ampersand A, Brad is happy and Angelina is happy, and the simple sentence, Jen is happy, 
are pasted together into a larger conjunction. So the brackets are to indicate that all of that goes together as a conjunction, which is the left conjunct of a larger conjunction. So there's our first binary connective. So let's return to the second page of our handout from some notes and exercise questions to consider the second binary connective. So this is the second line from the top. The connective symbol looks like a lowercase v. Don't ask me why, but every logic textbook uses this symbol to indicate a particular logical relation, even though with all of the others I've got alternative symbols in brackets. So this symbol is called the vel, and the basic English equivalent of this symbol is the word or. So, Jen is happy or Angelina is happy. Instead of being called a conjunction, this particular sentence is called a disjunction. And each of the two parts, instead of being called conjuncts, are being called disjuncts. Now, you'll notice also in the chart that after the word or, I put the word inclusive. You may not have realized it, but you've always sort of been aware of a distinction linguists make between what they call the inclusive or and the exclusive or. Suppose you were in a class where all the instructor did was just regurgitate the stuff in the textbook. The instructor might even tell you at the beginning of class, all you need to do in this class is read the textbook or come to the lectures. That will give you all the information you need to know for this class. Suppose then the instructor sees you in the class for several days in a row, again, you'd have to imagine non-COVID-19 times, and then one day the instructor sees you sitting in the lounge reading the textbook and comes up to you and says, what are you doing reading the textbook? I said to you that you could learn all the stuff you need to learn in this class by either coming to all the classes or reading the textbook. Your response, yeah. Suppose the instructor continued though. So why are you reading the textbook? There'd be a definite misunderstanding here. Here's a way of describing the nature of the uh, misunderstanding. When you heard the professor say, you can learn everything you need to learn by coming to all the classes, or by reading the textbook, you understood the word or inclusively. So if you look near the bottom on the left-hand side of the table, the inclusive use of the word or is one or the other or both. At least one. So you took what the instructor said to mean you can learn all the stuff you need to learn by coming to class or by reading the textbook or some combination of both. Whereas the instructor took the word or to be used exclusively. One or the other, but not both. Exactly one. Suppose you learned of this distinction between the inclusive and exclusive or. And then you went to your favorite restaurant, again, non-COVID-19 times, and you're told that with every entree, <clears throat> oh, oh comes a soup or salad. And you said, well, I think I'll have the chicken noodle soup and the Caesar salad. In this instance, the server would look at you and say, it says you can have soup or salad with your entree. 
What if your response was, well, yeah, but I learned in logic class today that there's an inclusive and an exclusive use of the word or, and I'm using the word inclusively to mean one or the other or both. So I'm going for the both option. Chicken noodle soup and Caesar salad, please. Now, what the server would say to you, although they might not say it in these exact words, is that, hold it, obviously the word or is being used exclusively here. In fact, that's kind of an unusual situation. Imagine a parallel situation where instead of going to a restaurant, you went home to your parents' house for the first time in a month, let's say, and you were having some meat, and you asked your mother, is there anything else I can have along with this meat? And your mother said, well, there's some rice. You can have rice or vegetables with the meat. Now, suppose you were having some rice, and your mother would come up to you, well, why aren't you having any vegetables with that? Well, you said I could have rice or vegetables. I took that to be uh, an exclusive use of the word or, so I went for the rice. Again, she wouldn't say it in these exact words. Obviously, I meant the word or inclusively in this case. One thing that linguists find amazing is how good average human beings are at determining what sense of the word or is called for in a whole range of different contexts. Here's the short story from a logician's point of view. We're going to use the vel here to indicate the inclusive or relation, one or the other or both, at least one, not the exclusive or relation, one or the other, but not both, exactly one. It, it turns out that the exclusive use of the word or, one way of looking at it, it's pretty rare. Another way of looking at it is that the so-called exclusive use of the word or only arises in situations where people realize that both options aren't available. So rather than having an exclusive use of the word or, we have an inclusive use of the word or, but the alternative of both of them is eliminated, in which case the inclusive becomes the exclusive or. So that being said, we are always going to translate in this class the English word or, or the English expression either or, with the vowel, understanding that that's going to indicate the inclusive or. It's going to indicate one or the other or both. There's a pretty prolonged argument we could consider um, to convince ourselves that, that this is really a safe and very reasonable alternative. But this is one thing um, I'm just going to have to ask you to trust me on this in order to save ourselves some theoretical time. So that gives us the unary connective, tilde, which is used to indicate the not relation. We've got the binary connective ampersand, which is used to indicate the conjunctive relation. And we've got the vel, which is used to indicate the disjunctive relation. There are two other connectives, as you see, on that table, but we're going to focus on these three for the next little while in order to 
bring across some points and learn how to engage in this process of converting compound English sentences into symbolic sentences in SL that exactly match the form or underlying logical structure of those English sentences. We're now going to consider what are called truth table definitions or characterizations of the various logical connectives. So we start off the truth table by considering the four possible situations we could have as far as two simple sentences go. So we've got the sentence P and we've got the sentence Q. Then we've got four possible worlds. Possible worlds are just different ways it could be. So in possible world one, P is true and Q is also true. In possible world two, P is true, but Q is false. In possible world three, P is false, but Q is true. And in possible world four, they're both false. So with two sentences, there are four different possible worlds, or four different ways it could be. Now, each one of the compound sentences, and every sentence containing one or more logical connectives is a compound sentence, we can always determine the truth or falsity of that compound sentence purely in terms of the truth or falsity of its constituent parts. So this is what's called being truth functional. The simplest case scenario, tilde P. Let's say uppercase P stands for she got paid today. So in possible world one, it's true that she got paid today. That means that tilde P, the negation of the claim that she got paid today, must be false. In possible world two, P is also true. It's Q that's false, but that's not relevant to us, which means tilde P is also false. In possible world three, though, P is false, which means tilde P, or the negation or denial of P, must be true, and the same with the fourth one. Now we can move to the two binary sentences, uh, or the two sentences connected with the binary connective. So we start off with the conjunction, P and Q. In possible world one, P is true and Q is true, so the conjunction of them is also true. In possible world two, P is true, but Q is false. So the conjunction of P and Q must be false, because the only way a double claim like that can be true is if both parts, both conjuncts are true. So in possible world three, P is false, even though Q is true, which means the conjunction of them is false, and in the final situation, they're both false, so the conjunction of them is false. Next we move, so notice then, the conjunction is only true in one situation, where both conjuncts are true. Otherwise, it's false. What about the disjunction? And remember the vel is being used to indicate the inclusive or, one or the other, or both. So in possible world one, both P and Q is true, so the disjunction of them is true. 
In possible world 2, P is true, but Q is false. The disjunction of them is still true, since it only requires one of them being true. In possible world 3, P is false, but Q is true. So the disjunction of them is still true, because at least one of them is true. The only situation where a disjunction is false is when both of the disjuncts are false. So that's a truth table characterization of the negation, the conjunction, and the disjunction. Now, I'd like us to consider these two situations in order to understand a little better how the tilde works. The rule for the tilde is that it always applies to the first full sentence that comes immediately after it, or immediately to the right of it. So in this case, we've got tilde P vel Q. This means that the tilde applies only to the sentence P, that is to say, only to the left disjunct. It doesn't apply to the entire disjunction. So, here we can use tilde P, it's truth or falsity that we figured out. So tilde P is going to be false, false, true, true. Q, looking over here, is going to be true, false, true, false. So the disjunction uh, tilde P, or Q, is going to be true in possible world 1, because the right disjunct Q is true. It's going to be false in possible world 2, because both disjuncts are false. It's going to be true in possible world 3, because both disjuncts are true. And it's also going to be true in possible world 4, because this disjunct, not P, but tilde P, is true. And even though Q is false, the disjunction of them is still true. So we can now erase these two. So that's the truth or falsity of tilde P or Q. We can now move on to consider the truth or falsity of tilde, and then we've got the disjunction P or Q in brackets. The point of the brackets here is they make it so that the tilde refers to the entire disjunction, because once the brackets are there, that's the first sentence immediately to the right of the tilde. When the brackets aren't there, like in this case, the first sentence immediately to the right is just P. So, the truth or falsity of this negated disjunction is just going to be the opposite of the truth or falsity of the disjunction, which we've laid out here. In other words, it's going to be false, 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 and finally, it's only going to be true in the situation where both P and Q are false. So, what does this one say if we were to render it in English? This one would be either P is false or Q. Not P or Q. What about this one, though? Tilde, and then in brackets, P or Q. The typical English expression for a sentence with this structure would be neither P nor Q. Finally, let's consider a conjunction 
but where both of the conjuncts are negated. So, that's going to give us, we'll start with the left conjunct, it's going to be false, false, true, true. The right conjunct is going to be false, true, false, true. And the conjunction is only true when both conjuncts are true, which means it's going to be false, impossible world one, false, impossible world two, false, impossible world three. It's only going to be true, impossible world four. So, one thing I want to draw your attention to is the fact that The negated disjunction and the non-negated conjunction, where each of the conjuncts are negated, have identical patterns here. They're both false in possible world one, false in possible world two, false in possible world three, and they're both only true in possible world four. What that indicates is that these two sentences are logically equivalent. They're different ways of getting at the exact same compound commitment about how the world is. This one says neither P nor Q is true. This one says P is false and Q is false as well. If you think about it, two different ways of saying the same thing. Now you'll notice I've moved the two that used to be over here over to here. So we've got the negated disjunction, the non-negated conjunction, where both conjuncts are negated, they're false in possible worlds 1, 2, and 3. They're both true in possible world 4. Now let's consider the mirror image, namely a negated conjunction and a non-negated disjunction where each of the disjuncts are negated. If you remember from earlier, or you can just look at your notes, the only time a conjunction is true is when both of the conjuncts are true. Otherwise, it's false. So, the conjunction inside the brackets would be true, false, false, false. But, what we're interested in determining here is not the conjunction, but the negation of that conjunction. And that would just be the opposite, in other words, it would be false in possible world one, the claim that P and Q is not the case, or P and Q is false, would itself be false in possible world one, because P and Q are both true. But in possible world two, three, and four, the negated conjunction would be true. So we can take that one off. Now we've got the non-negated disjunction, but each of the two disjuncts are negated. So the left disjunct is going to be false, impossible worlds 1 and 2, true impossible worlds 3 and 4. The right disjunct, tilde Q, is going to be false impossible world 1, true impossible world 2, false impossible world 3, true impossible world 4. Now we want to determine the truth or falsity, what's often referred to as the truth value, it's kind of a fancy term, there are only two values, true and false, 
Although if we changed all of these trues and falses to ones and zeros, we could characterize all of this stuff in a binary fashion. So, the first situation, the left disjunct tilde P is false, so this is possible world one. The right disjunct tilde Q is false, which means the disjunction of those two negated sentences must be false. In possible worlds 2, 3, and 4, though, the left one is false, but the right one is true, so the disjunction is true. The right one is true, even though the left one is false, so the disjunction is true. And finally, they're both true, so the disjunction of them is true. So. We end up then in a situation again where these two sentences are, when the one on the right here, the negated conjunction is false, the non-negated disjunction with two negated disjuncts is also false, but when the negated conjunction is true, in possible worlds three, four, two, three, and four, that also holds for the non-negated disjunction of two negations. So these two are also logically equivalent to each other. These two are logically equivalent to each other, two different ways of getting at the same compound commitment. These two are logically equivalent to each other, two different ways of getting at the same compound commitment. One last thing to note though, these two make a very specific claim that is only true in one possible world, namely the one where both P and Q are false. These two over here, though, make a vaguer claim. We if one of these sentences is claimed, unlike the case where one of these sentences is claimed, you're not sure which possible world they're committing themselves to. It could be possible world two, because in, in that possible world both sentences are true. Could be possible world three, because in that world both sentences are true. Could be possible world four. The only thing you know is it isn't possible world one, so they've eliminated one of the four possibilities, but they've made no definite commitment um, regarding the other three. So that's a vague commitment about how the world is. With these two equivalent sentences, a much more definite commitment about how the world is. Possible worlds one, two, and three are all eliminated. They're definitely committing themselves to possible world four. Now let's consider symbolizing some sentences from English into the symbolic notation. We will end our second video by considering a number of sentences here that we will symbolize from English into the symbolic notation we're learning. In the process of symbolization, there's always three possible things that are going to occur in an English sentence that we need to be on the lookout for. The first one is Simple proposition indicating words or phrases. The second one, logical relation. Ooh, how did that get there? Logical relation indicating words or phrases. And finally, 
words or phrases that are not logically relevant and need to be edited out. So let's start with the first English sentence here. Brad is happy, Jen isn't, unfortunately. In this sentence, the first clause, Brad is happy, is about as straightforward as we could want. That three-word string is an indicator of the propositional commitment we can symbolize with capital B. Jen isn't, unfortunately. There we have a not that's in the contracted word isn't, and we also have a situation very common in English, isn't what, we may ask ourselves. Isn't happy, of course. Generally speaking, in English, you don't say things like, Brad is happy, Jen is not happy, in a robot-like fashion. Instead, English has an endless number of stylistic turns of phrase, but the longer you become acquainted with English, and the longer you become acquainted with this process of looking to zero in on the underlying logical implications of an English sentence, the simpler it becomes. So what kind of sentence is being indicated here? by the English sentence, Brad is happy, Jen isn't, unfortunately. Well, the unfortunately is an example of a word or phrase that's not logically relevant, so we can just cross that out, so to speak. That's not going to appear in our symbolization because it's not logically significant. So we have Brad is happy, comma, Jen isn't. Here's an example where we have a conjunction, even though there's no word indicating the conjunction. The conjunction is indicated simply by the comma. So the symbolization for one is going to be Brad is happy and it's not the case that Jen is happy. So we're going to be taking away this comment and we're going to be just zeroing in on the underlying logical implications or the compound propositional commitment about how the world is that's indicated by that sentence. What about the second one? Neither Jen nor Angelina is happy. So Angelina is happy, that's capital A. Jen, again, is happy, is also going to be attached to that. And then we have this logical relation indicator phrase that's separated by the word Jen, neither nor. If you recall from our earlier discussion, the way that would be symbolized is it's not the case that Angelina is happy or that Jen is happy. Now, if you recall from our earlier discussion, a logically equivalent way of symbolizing the logical implications of this sentence would be to say it's not the case that Angelina is happy and it's not the case that Jen is happy. So either of those is a correct answer. Both of them are a correct answer. As far as the first exam goes, and there's going to be about 50% of the first exam where you'll be given English sentences and you'll have to provide the symbolization of them, this would be an entirely correct answer, and so would this one. On the other hand, 
What if you were to symbolize them in such a way that one of the answers you gave was completely correct, but the second answer you gave had a problem with it? Do you think Wayne would say, oh, well, at least one of their answers was correct, so I'll give them full marks, even though the other answer was problematic? No, Wayne's going to take marks off for that. So if you want to show off, make sure that both of the answers you give are entirely correct. Okay, the third one. Jen is not sad, or Brad is happy. This one would be, it's not the case that Jen is sad, or Brad is happy, or both of them. So notice, with no brackets, the tilde negation indicator simply applies to the simple sentence, Jen is sad, not to the entire disjunction. The fourth sentence, Brad and Angelina aren't both happy. Well, Brad is happy and Angelina is happy. If we put brackets in a tilde, it's not the case that both Brad and Angelina are happy. Once again, you could also correctly symbolize it by saying either Brad's not happy or Angelina's not happy, or both of them. That also gets at the logical commitment, the compound logical commitment indicated by the English sentence, Brad and Angelina aren't both happy. We end off with question five. Brad is not happy, but Jen is, comma. In addition, Angelina is finally no longer angry. Here we've got a sentence where the comma is the grammatical and logical dividing point. So what occurs before the sentence? Brad is not happy, but Jen is happy. So that's tilde B. It's not the case that Brad's happy and Jen is happy. And then we've got the second part of the sentence. In addition, Angelina is finally no longer angry. So what's being indicated in this second part of the sentence? A further conjunction is indicated by the two-word phrase, in addition. So we'll put brackets around the stuff before the comma, indicating that it goes together, and we'll put a conjunction indicator for the words in addition. Then we have Angelina is finally, this word finally is not logically relevant, but depending on the discussion, there may be a uh, very good reason for putting it there. Angelina is no longer angry. Well, Angelina is angry as G, so it's tilde G. So there are symbolizations for each of these five English sentences. At this point, our second video lecture will end, but I wouldn't allow this lecture to end, sorry, without giving you some homework. If you turn to the Sum Notes and Exercise Questions file, you will see on page 5, Exercise 2-4. Exercise 2-4 is assignment 1. So your homework is to symbolize the 11 English sentences. They tell you what capital letters to use on the assignment page. I'll be posting the solutions for assignment 1 sometime next week. And in the third lecture, we will be moving on to consider the other two logical connectives. So we will see everyone next week.